Welcome back to my channel. Today let's do chapter 19, Jared's point of view. I think this whole night has backfired, I said, looking at Mitch's untouched bacon chicken salad with oil and a balsamic vinaigrette on the side. Once again, Mitch had cut pieces and pushed them around his plate. I was hoping to make him forget for a moment, be goofy and weird like last week, but it's not happening. How bad was it? Michaela asked and placed her right hand, the one the kids called the claw, on mine. He said that every time he closed his eyes, he relived that night. I folded my hand over Michaela's. Sometimes I get so angry. Other times I would do anything to bring Mitch back to normal. And you? Jaw said. It's different for me, I said. It's not that night. It's the day after that bothers me. You didn't see Mitch stumbling to the dojo for help or watch them wash the glass out of his hair. When they worked on his feet, Mitch grabbed my hand like it was the only thing keeping him sane and only let go when they gave him something to sleep. Mitch sees Bailey when he closes his eyes, but I see a broken Mitch. Michaela set her fork down, tears brimming in her eyes. We only saw him after they had cleaned him up, put him to bed and sedated him. It still looked pretty bad. I got a glimpse when they had him in the ER, I said, cutting his clothes off and checking for broken ribs or a concussion, and you should have seen the doctor's face when they checked Mitch's glucose. Mitch walked back from the bathroom, carrying the coffee-stained shirt. He slid his hair over by mine and sat next to me. Can you put your arm around your date, please? He said in a small, tired voice. The request surprised me. I did as he wanted, and he snuggled into me like a lost kid. I'm sorry about all this. Do you want me to take you home? I asked. No, Mitch held me. I'm supposed to be the straight one, but it felt so good having him safe and next to me. I held him tight, but I didn't know if I did it to make him feel safe or to make me feel better. I'm really tired, Mitch said. Just ignore me. Mitch's eyes drooped and he moved as if he could barely stand. Last weekend had defeated him. His sense of independence was gone. His sense of worth shattered. Are you sure you want to stay? I asked. Mitch picked up a piece of bacon from his salad and took a small bite. I'm sorry, guys. It's been a bad few days. Do you want to tell us about it? Michaela said. Why don't you tell us about the hospital? Jaw said. Any cute nurses? There was this blonde guy in the emergency room, Mitch began. Did you ask him out? I asked. Mitch actually smiled. He had a wedding ring. For the first time since I had known him, Mitch could be himself his true self. The waitress returned and refilled our glasses and Mitch's coffee. A few minutes later, she brought a custom fresh berry bowl for each of us, drizzled with a low sugar berry sauce that smelled like heaven and tasted like something off a cooking show. The chef made this special, our waitress said. Blueberries, strawberries, blackberries, and raspberries smothered in pomegranate juice. Very low carb and no charge. We're sorry you had such a hard time finding something to eat, but you come on back. We're ready for you. I tuned the conversation out and stared around the other tables. Another line dance started, and you could tell those people who had one beer too many. One man sloshed instead of danced. His feet were hilariously off any rhythm. He was laughing, bumping into people, having fun, but a couple left the line and went back to their seats. How many times had that been me, drunk and knowing I was a good dancer, even as I collided with the person next to me? The music started again, and the line dancers all kicked and danced and howled, but the drunk guy fell over. Two people, his friends I guess, hauled his butt off the dance floor. 
Here I was, sober, with sober people, having a sober crisis. God, I needed a beer. Mitch had finally relaxed. The strangest part of the strange evening? I had enjoyed dancing with Mitch. You couldn't call it dancing. We stood there holding each other, with Mitch quietly crying. It wasn't a big night of fun and frolic and drunken revelry. It was nice. No fireworks, no flashy moves, no drunk spectacles. It was just nice, pleasant. A night I would remember in the morning. It was also nice to have Mitch curled into my arm. I knew he was safe. And in the loudness of the music and the shouting of the dancers and the general chaos of the steakhouse, I found a little bit of happiness. Michaela told us about some new project at her work and how the programs on the computer had screwed up the measurements. She had to redesign a new ad by hand instead of by computer, and her boss liked it better. Josh told us about one of his professors who didn't like computers and refused to do anything online. His finals were legendary essay events that required non-stop cramming for weeks. Mitch actually ate a couple of bites, but didn't otherwise budge from my shoulder. It felt good having him pressed up against me, like he belonged. It was better having Mitch here, tucked into my shoulder, than seeing him in front of the dojo. Seeing a desperate Mitch stagger to the dojo in nothing but a blanket and a ripped t-shirt still hurt. Ironically, Mitch currently wore the shirt I had bought that weekend, and he looked good. I needed to take up karate. Look at his arms. Look at the way his chest filled out the shirt and the firmness of the muscles. No doubt, Mitch looked sexy in the vintage Aerosmith, but he shouldn't have had to wear it or the sky blue silk. When had I come to care so much about my best friend? Sunday, when I read his journal and I met the man he hid inside. Michaela and Josh went to join a new, la new line dance. We had a moment to ourselves. I asked, why didn't you ever tell anybody? Sitting up, Mitch looked at me and gave me a pathetic smile. Who would have believed me? The music changed to something slower. The line dancers vacated the floor. As if on cue, Mitch stood up. Join me in a dance, please? Mitch's eyes glistened, and he offered me his hand. The odd thing, I still wore the corsage. I took his hand with the one that had the corsage on it and let Mitch lead me into our shadowy corner of the floor. I placed my hands on Mitch's waist while Mitch wrapped his arms around my neck and leaned in as close as he could. Our cheeks almost touched, and Mitch lowered his voice so only I could hear him. I need to say something that I should have said years ago, Mitch said. So let me talk a minute. My head's kind of jumbled, so it might come out kind of messy. As messy as my backyard, I said. Messier, Mitch said, and glanced away for a moment. He pulled back, and his eyes connected with mine. I heard what you said to Michaela and Josh, and you were right. I needed you so much at the hospital, and you were there. Last weekend was a nightmare, and I don't know how I survived it. I only did because you were there to guide me through it. Thank you for being my friend. Mitch's eyes showed his vulnerability. My best friend was laying his soul out, risking my reaction. Mitch was about to do something he had never done before trusting me with his inner pain. Something opened inside my heart and I closed my eyes. I placed a hand on Mitch's shoulder, afraid to say a single word because it might break that fragile bond he wanted to forge. I fell in love with you years ago, Mitch said. 
even though I knew it was never to be. Somehow, you kept me safe and you let one strange mixed up kid be your friend. And that meant more to me than you can ever realize. You gave me a place to escape to, gave me someplace safe, and never asked any questions. You trusted me when I was too afraid to trust you, and you're doing it again, helping me through the pain that is too much to handle. I rested my head against Mitch's, my own eyes filling with tears. I bit my lip to stay quiet because I knew how hard this must be for him. I want you to know just how much I love you, Jared Parker. And I know we can never be more than friends, but that's good enough for me. All these years, I've just wanted someone to talk to, but I was too afraid. I wanted someone who could listen to what was going on inside me. And even though I turned into a freak show, it didn't matter to me. You gave me a chance. That stunned me. Mitch thought of himself as ugly as this truck and a freak. Damn, Bailey. How could he destroy his own son like that? Someone so innocent, so beautiful. Even my dad wasn't that bad. He left, but he never hit me. He yelled a few times, but never called me anything but his son. Bailey had trapped Mitch in hell. It shouldn't be called the Monster House, but hell on earth. Thank you for making me feel special, Mitch continued. Nobody else did that. Shit. Mitch is bearing his entire soul, and it is breaking through all my defenses. The first tear spilled from my eyes. Don't say this, Mitch, because I might realize something, too. I pulled away just far enough to look at Mitch. No one has ever done that for me. Not my parents, not anyone, ever. You didn't stop until you found me, and... Mitch said and held me tighter. Mitch blinked. His voice wavered. You didn't stop. You never stopped looking. I don't even know how to say thanks. You've been my best friend for years. More than a friend. I didn't think anyone cared. I thought I was alone. No home, no family, no friends. You saved me. Mitch bit his lips, and his face reddened as he fought the emotion. I love you. Then I realized that what I had been feeling went far past two best friends hanging out. I wanted to protect him. I cared for him. I closed my eyes, the tears spilling out. I read your journal, and I saw the part of you that no one had seen before. And I realized something. We haven't been best friends for years. I think we've been boyfriends and just never knew it. Mitch Lassiter, I love you too. Mitch gasped. You do? He closed his eyes and I felt the ragged breathing as he fought to control his own emotions. Did I dare ask what I wanted to? Did I dare take us to another level? It would mean I would have to redefine myself. I was scared. Not the kind of scared when you're at the bar trying to hit on someone, but the kind when you know you are about to jump off the high dive and there is no way to take back what you've done. It took me a moment to breathe, to contemplate what I would say next, because in one sentence, I would change everything. Stepping off the high dive, I felt that odd, queasy sensation in my stomach as I plunged into a new world. I leaned in close to Mitch, and whispered, Now would be a good time to kiss your date. You don't know what that would do to me, Mitch quietly said. I asked you once what it was like kissing a boy for you. Do you remember what you said? Mitch nodded. I got excited. For the first time in months, I'm excited. I reached up and caressed Mitch's right cheek with my thumb. I feel something deeper something that aches. Just being near you, I... Mitch leaned in, paused, and opened his eyes. He hovered an inch away, his breath warm. We shouldn't do this, he whispered, edging closer. His eyes slowly closed. You'll hate me in the... Our lips connected. 
Mitch gave a slight sob, another tear falling as our lips teased each other, gentling each other, easing into a kiss, a chaste, virginal kiss. I didn't want that for us, and I don't think Mitch did either. Mid-kiss, I stepped off the high dive again. I pulled Mitch in tight, my mouth opening slightly, as I let my tongue probe forward to tickle his lips. He gasped slightly, my tongue easing past Mitch's lips to flirt with his tongue. My heart beat strong and rapid. Mitch's body quivered, his arms tightened around my neck. I held my breath. Mitch filled me with a longing I'd never felt before. It wasn't a chaste kiss. Raoul had taught Mitch well. Mitch pulled away first, slightly flushed, and took a timid breath. We shouldn't do this. I opened my eyes and wiped my lips dry. My breath trembled. My pants had suddenly become a little tighter. One kiss, only one kiss, and something tender melted inside me. I felt a flush across my cheeks. If you tell me to stop, I will. But I love you. Me too. I reached a hand to the back of Mitch's head and gently pulled him closer. When our lips met, it was with an urgency that I had never known before. I broke the kiss and held Mitch. I think I've loved you for a very long time, I said. I just didn't know the words for it. Mitch Lassiter, I want to see you smiling again. Not Lassiter, just Mitch. I'm never being a Lassiter again. If your mom will let me, I've wanted to be a Parker for, for, you already are. I reached for Mitch's right hand, took a hold of it, and intertwined my fingers with his. Mitch's hands weren't cold anymore. You already are.